A seminal moment in the Cold War occurred on May 1, 1960, when CIA pilot Francis Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union in his U-2 spy plane. The U-2 incident revealed what the Soviets have been claiming for years, that the United States was illegally violating Soviet airspace with secret spy missions. And yet the extent of these flights that the Air Force called ferret flights was a closely held secret that wasn't revealed for decades. And the earlier ones of those flights did not occur in the high-flying U-2, but in special versions of the Boeing B-47 Stratojet. The Boeing B-47 was the result of the first United States requirement issued for a jet-powered bomber aircraft. The Museum of the United States Air Force writes that designed to meet a 1944 requirement, the first XB-47 prototype flew in December 1947, performing far beyond its competitors. It incorporated many advanced features for the time, including swept wings, jet engines in underwing pods, fuselage-mounted main landing gear, and automated systems that reduced the standard crew size to three. The jet, powered by six turbojet engines, could carry approximately the same bomb loads as the B-29 and B-50 radial engine bombers that it replaced, yet it could fly some 200 miles per hour faster. Although subsonic, the B-47 could fly higher and faster than jet interceptors being designed at the time. The B-47 became a mainstay of the U.S. Strategic Bomber Forces, and more than 2,000 were produced between 1951 and 1957. And yet, during that period, the B-47 bomber never saw combat. Its capabilities as a bomber were never tested. But that doesn't mean that the airframe was not tested in combat, as the B-47 was not only used as a bomber. In his 1998 Ph.D. dissertation for the University of Virginia, Robert Smith Hopkins III explains that, after the Second World War, American means to gather information about the Soviet Union were severely limited and failed to satisfy U.S. intelligence requirements. American policymakers redress this deficiency by endorsing the use of long-range reconnaissance flights along the periphery of, and often over, the Soviet Union and its allies. In 1955, President Eisenhower proposed making such flights legal via a treaty at the Geneva summit called the Open Skies Proposal. The website of the History Channel explains Eisenhower dramatically unveiled what came to be known as his Open Skies Proposal. He called for the United States and the Soviet Union to exchange maps indicating the exact location of every military installation in their respective nations. With these maps at hand, each nation would then be allowed to conduct aerial surveillance of the installations in order to assure that the other nations were in compliance with any arms control agreements that might be reached. Although the History Channel continues, the Soviets rejected any plan that would leave their nation subject to surveillance by a Western power. The Office of the Historian of the United States Department of State noted Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev refused the proposal, continuing the established Soviet policy of rejecting international inspections in any form. Meanwhile, Khrushchev also claimed that the Soviet Union had developed numerous intercontinental ballistic missiles, which only motivated the United States government to look for new ways to verify developments in the Soviet nuclear program. But in fact, the U.S. was already doing overflights, albeit in secret. The website B-29s over Korea explains, In fact, Eisenhower had forbidden any flights over Soviet airspace at the time, saying that they amounted to acts of war. At least that's what the public and the rest of the president's staff and cabinet were led to believe. But Ike and his head of the Strategic Air Command, General Curtis E. LeMay, and the Secretaries of Defense and State, all four, knew differently. The Smithsonian's Air and Space magazine explains, Ferret flights, as the reconnaissance missions have been nicknamed, dated back to World War II, when converted bombers carrying electronic equipment located enemy radar stations. Cold War ferret flights, made by the Navy and Air Force, had a similar purpose, pinpointing the location and capabilities of the enemy's radar. In the event of nuclear war with the Soviet Union, the information would be critical to the U.S. Strategic Air Command bombers, which would have to jam, destroy, or evade radar in order to strike Soviet targets. But, Air and Space magazine continues, the flights included extreme risks for the crews. Surveillance crews were jammed into cramped compartments where they huddled over radar screens and electronic monitoring devices. They were told that if they were shot down, they were on their own. They couldn't expect rescue. Retired Air Force Colonel Donald E. Hillman wrote in 2002, Virtually all of these flights took place around the periphery of the Soviet Union, probing its radar defenses and attempting to obtain oblique photographs of military installations a few miles inside Soviet territory. But some of them, an exceptional few, in violation of international treaties, actually traversed Soviet territory, seeking indications of any military preparations that might portend a surprise atomic attack on the United States. <laughs>
Several different types of planes were used, including eventually the U-2 flown by Francis Gary Powers. But among those was the B-47. The Museum of the United States Air Force notes that in addition to its role as a nuclear strike bomber, the Stratojet's speed and payload made it a useful strategic reconnaissance aircraft. Airvectors.net describes the reconnaissance version. Boeing Wichita built 240 RB-47E reconnaissance machines, similar to the B-47E but with a nose stretched by 34 inches, giving them an arguably more pleasing appearance than the bomber variants of the B-47. The long nose was used to stow up to 11 cameras. The RB-47E could carry photo flash flares for night reconnaissance. Its fuel capacity was increased to a total of 18,400 U.S. gallons. The navigator controlled the cameras, becoming a navigator photographer instead of a navigator bombardier. Globalsecurity.org opines that the RB-47E was the best of the B-47s. While the B-47 was never used in combat as a bomber, it was a different story for the reconnaissance aircraft. Globalsecurity.org continues. The reconnaissance version of the B-47 was the only plane which flew actual combat missions that the military may have found necessary to perform in case of nuclear war. They were used to constantly check weather along projected bombing routes, photograph enemy installations, and monitor defensive radar systems. Reconnaissance models of the B-47 provided invaluable data for Strategic Air Command's huge bomber fleet during the period 1954 to 1964. Following its first flight on July 3, 1953, the RB-47E went on to perform some of the most sensitive reconnaissance missions of the Cold War. In 1995, retired Colonel Harold Hal Austin described a mission that occurred May 8, 1954. On the 8th of May, the three RB-47 crews for the mission were briefed separately and apart by two Strategic Air Command intelligence colonels. Our particular mission was to penetrate Soviet airspace and take pictures of nine Soviet airfields to find out for General LeMay if the new MiGs, MiG-17s, were deployed to the area. The other two aircraft would proceed with us to a point about 100 miles north of Murmansk and then return to base. Such missions were highly secret. Airvectors.net writes that operations were top secret, with the missions usually flown at night and even base commanders often not knowing what was going on. When crews were asked what they were doing, they always replied that such information was classified. At first, the mission went as planned. 100 miles north of Murmansk, the other two RB-47s turned back as planned, but Austin and his crew continued into Soviet territory. They took pictures of Soviet air bases near Murmansk. Austin's co-pilot, Captain Carl Holt, was quoted in the 2002 book Boeing B-47 Stratojet, True Stories of the Cold War in the Air. It was a clear day as we coasted into the Soviet Union. Suddenly we started to generate contrails like six white arrows pointing to our airplane. As we passed over our first recon target, I could see the fighters circling up to meet us and knew that it would only be a matter of time before they reached up to our altitude. Austin recalled about the time we finished photos of the second airfield, we were joined by a flight of three Soviet MiGs. But the MiGs did not attack, and the RB-47 crew continued their mission, assuming they would be safe, as Austin explains. We had been briefed by intel that the MiG-15 would not be able to do any damage to us at 40,000 feet, with our true airspeed on the order of 440 knots. But the crew was in for a surprise. Austin writes, Well, you can imagine what we called those intelligence weenies as the first Soviet MiG-17, not a MiG-15, made a firing pass at us from the left rear and we saw cannon tracer shells going both above and below our aircraft. The second MiG-17 made his firing pass, and I don't care who knows. It was scary watching tracers go over and under our aircraft. The B-47 was generally intended to operate beyond the capabilities of fighter interceptors, but it was equipped with a remote control twin 20mm turret in its tail. But the remotely operated turret was notoriously finicky. As Holt went to operate the gun, it didn't work. Austin writes that it was typical for the two remotely controlled 20mm cannons not to fire. Holt recalled that I had trouble getting the tail guns to fire, and since I was in the reverse seat position, I could not eject in case of a direct hit. Also, the radar firing screens would not work, so I felt a little like Wyatt Earp, looking out the back end of the canopy and firing at will. Austin writes that he told Holt he better kick them or something because if our guns don't fire, the next SOB will come directly up our tailpipes. Fortunately, when the third MiG started his pursuit pass, our guns burped for a couple of seconds. The short burst, at least, kept the Soviet fighters off their tail, even though Austin writes, of course, the MiGs didn't know that our guns would not fire again even though the co-pilot pleaded, and I believe he did at least kick the panel, trying to get them to work. Still, the MiGs continued their attacks, one of which, Austin writes, made a lucky hit that knocked out the plane's intercom and damaged the UHF radio. 
Austin recalls that we felt a good whap, and all three of us were a little bit anxious, but doing our mission as briefed, basically because of habit. I firmly believe that that's what good, tough, LeMay-type sack training did for his combat crews. Holt recalls that, frustrated, one MiG tried to ram us by sideslipping into our aircraft. On one ramming pass, he stalled out right under our aircraft, and our vertical camera took one of the first close-up pictures of the new MiG-17. The intelligence community was elated at the picture. Several more MiGs tried to attack the plane, but Austin and his crew were able to escape Soviet airspace. But the excitement was not quite over. Globalsecurity.org writes that after a high-altitude running battle, Colonel Austin and his crew crossed into Finnish airspace and escaped their pursuers. However, their tanker had given up on them and returned to base. Austin's aircraft was damaged and very short of fuel. 150 nautical miles from England, it looked like they would not make it, and all their efforts would come to nothing with the loss of their invaluable film. Austin tried to contact the alert tanker at Bryce Norton, but the radio was damaged and only a broken message was heard by Jim Ridgely, the captain of the waiting KC-97G. Ridgely recognized Austin's voice and guessed he needed help. However, Bry's air traffic control had an emergency in progress and refused Ridgely's permission to take off. Ridgely took off anyway and met Austin's RB-47 as it descended towards Bry's. He turned in front of the stratojet and with Austin's gauges reading zero, he pumped it in 12,000 pounds of fuel. Austin wrote that in all of my nine years of flying up to that time, I was never more thrilled to see another airplane in the air than I was to see that beautiful KC-97 that day. Globalsecurity.org writes that Ridgely faced a court-martial back at Bryce Norton, but SAC Commander General Curtis LeMay personally quashed the charges. Austin writes that LeMay quipped in his debriefing that there are probably several openings today in command positions in the Soviet Union since you were not shot down. Holt recalled that I thought we were in a cold war with the Russians, not a hot one. During our briefing with General LeMay, I told him very innocently, Sir, they were trying to shoot us down. Smoking his usual long cigar, he paused, leaned back, and said, What did you think they would do? Give you an ice cream cone? To underline the secrecy of such missions, Austin writes that because of the need-to-know classification, my crew was never allowed to see the pictures that we took. But General LeMay said that they were really good. In fact, Austin noted, if General Courtesy LeMay was still alive, I might have second thoughts on telling about this mission even though it's been over 55 years. Austin and his crew were awarded distinguished flying crosses. He writes that LeMay could not award them the Silver Stars because recommendation for the Silver Star had to be approved in Washington. And I quote, I'd have to explain this mission to too damn many people who don't need to know. B-29s of Korea writes what LeMay really feared was global exposure of his spy in the sky operations and any possible embarrassment the commander in chief would suffer should the Soviets be able to confirm their accusations of overflights. Acts of aggression. These missions were carried out in extreme secrecy. The details of Austin and Holt's flight were not declassified clear until 1995. No RB-47s were shot down over the Soviet Union, but two were shot down over international waters while conducting surveillance flights. Eisenhower ordered an end to overflights after Francis Gary Powers' U-2 was shot down in 1960 and wreckage of his plane was recovered. The incident soured U.S.-Soviet relations at the time. Eventually, the advent of spy satellites made such flights unnecessary. Despite the international ramifications, Hopkins argues that the strategic reconnaissance flights actually contributed more to international stability than they did to East-West tensions, because they reassured American policymakers that war with the USSR was not imminent, and thus allowed more measured and less belligerent responses in times of crisis. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.